I want to try to get across um, two themes uh, today, and I think that they are essential for us being able to navigate to what this world is going to look like soon. The first has to do with sustainable research, and what I mean by that is ways in which the data is reused, people work together, the things that we learned in many other aspects of our lives, but in fact, in many ways, we have yet to learn in terms of how we deal with each other in biomedical research. And also, I want to talk about a concept of open knowledge currency exchange. Money is a currency. I'm going to argue that knowledge is a currency, and we need to use that as a currency. Um, we're at a time of transition. Um, People always think they're at times of transition. Scientists are always excited something new is coming along. But I fundamentally think there were this shift in, in a time of transition. In terms, particularly in medicine, as we shift from thinking that diseases are just made of symptoms to how to represent them molecularly, in terms of the concept that when someone says, I have Alzheimer's or I have cancer, that in fact there's no one disease. I think we're getting used to that, but I don't think we see the consequences of that. And also, um, more recently, this concept that actually we've put a lot of effort into studying disease and a little less into wellness, and I'm going to end with a little bit on that. But to do this, I want to start, and I want to give you a representation of, of, the, of the way that it's important to look at how utterly complex we are finding those simple um, organisms, our cells, diseases to be. And I think um, this makes a lot of sense after uh, John Quackenbush's uh, um, talk yesterday. <clears throat> I'm just going to give a couple of examples. Um, when we represent disease and we make a signaling pathway, here's an EGF uh, signaling pathway. This looks nice for displays in uh, booths for drug companies saying, this is where my drug works. Okay? But the reality is that in any one of those pathways, if you disrupt any protein along one of those signaling pathways, it ends up that not only do you change the pathway, duh, that's like a transistor in a radio and you pull out one part, but this is important. You change the function of every other component on that pathway, not just the one you pulled out. Nice paper, Frank McCormick on the RAS pathway showing that last year. Another way of representing this is um, how many of you have seen examples where someone has taken expression profiles? I used to do a fair amount of work in that area. And you'll watch some group say, here is a way to build a classifier. Here's a way to represent different uh, components, different categories of a disease. And then you watch paper after paper come out, and everyone has a different view of what that is. Now, this is important. This is not because someone did it correctly and another person did not. This is because, in fact, there is a diversity, a complexity in who's looking at whom and what they are looking at, not necessarily the tool. And I think the best example of this comes um, from a very powerful concept, which was, let's use synthetic lethal screens to understand uh, ways of finding therapies for activated RAS. Here are four friends of mine. Each had a, a, a paper out. I don't need to now tell you how often their results agreed with each other. They didn't. Okay? Four great people. They all did good experiments. Everyone came up with a different answer. So wh what is going on here at a DNA level, you could say at a protein level, at a functional level, is that <clears throat> we have been comfortable looking at representations of, of diseases, of pathways. Here's that EGFR pathway. Here's a, a P21, JAK, STAT. And I think what we're beginning to realize is that for any one of those proteins, in a different context, that protein's going to have a different function. And so we need to be able to think about how we're going to work with that level of complexity. And I think it was really nicely said by um, Eric Schott. I work a lot with Eric Schott. And he said, you know, our brains are, high, are hardwired for the narrative. <laughs> We love storytelling. We like things going in some linear fashion. But in fact, that's not how we got through evolution. That's not the way the cell is put together. Instead, every circuit has an impact on every other uh, component of the cell. And so I think if you extrapolate out like that, and I think we're still 
barely able to do that in terms of thinking about it. It's very much like what the physicists did when they began looking at subatomic space and all the rules that Newton had uh, developed were um, no longer making sense. We have to acknowledge that we're alchemists. Chemists passed through that phase of being alchemists to chemists in the 1700s, 1800s, the periodic table. And I'm going to argue that what we're missing and the reason why it's so inefficient to do drug discovery, to figure out what's going on, is that in fact we don't have the rules. And I'm going to talk about what it takes to actually develop the rules, not just this is associated with that. When I found that, that's alchemy. Okay? And I think we have to put a fundamental uh, amount of our time looking at what it is to discover those rules if we're going to be able to work more quickly. Why this is a problem I think it can be represented by these two questions. The NIH, uh, many uh, funding agencies, have over the last 20, 30 years put a, a strong emphasis on saying, you must do hypothesis-driven research. If you're not doing a hypothesis-driven research, what are you doing? Okay? And the problem is that when a scientist sitting in a lab, maybe not even in Seattle, um, trying to do their hypothesis-driven experiment, and they want to get their work into a one-name journal, what they do is they extrapolate from the particular to the general. They say, I found this, this is happening here, therefore, and this big therefore goes in, and then out on the, on the waves, you know, in the, in the um, scientific and the public press is, scientists finds this does that. Mm -hmm. And the reality is when that happens, you've just locked in a dogma that has very little evidence outside the particular. And we have to have a way of being able to embrace those multiple particulars if we're ever going to be able to understand that general. And so the um, slightly audacious uh, statement I'm going to make here is that actually maybe we'll be able to understand the rules more by looking at adjacent truths and the differences between those adjacent truths that we need to come up with a way, and I'll show you some ways to do this, where data that comes in on one experiment and looks this way, and another person has data that comes in in another way and looks in that experiment, et cetera, et cetera, that that actually is really valuable. Instead of that being discord, noise, that's signal. And when we begin to think that way, then we begin to think the way the physicists have, then we begin to talk about going to a data-driven world of biomedicine. So let's look at what it is that in, is involved in going to that data-driven world of biomedicine. And the good news is if you're willing to accept that level of complexity. Fortunately, in the last 10 plus years, there are lots of tools that have been popping up that no one ever had before that I'm going to argue are actually very valuable in actually trying to do that deciphering. The first everyone is familiar with. <clears throat> this is a concept of being able to generate not small, but super uh, large amounts of human omics data. And I mean RNA, DNA, RNA-seq, et cetera, et cetera, up to uh, proteomics. So I think everyone would say, yep, I have that at my, uh, at my beck and call. The second, and this is important, is if we're going to get out of those ball and stick diagrams, there have to be ways to simultaneously represent a protein or a function in multiple dimensions. And network modeling is a nice way to do that. And people who work in that area, I think, are really allowing us, allowing us to visualize, but also more than visualize, to conceptualize what's going on. The third is 10 plus years ago, the concept of saying uh, there are three hospitals that say um, uh, Caltech, working with Stanford, working with the Curie, who wanted to do a project, you had to literally move that data around. The, the ability to actually store and host data in the cloud where anyone can get to changes the game. If you're a postdoc and you're interested in working on a project, you don't have to sit next to the data that's being generated. The third, along those themes, is that the amount of data that we're generating and the ability to look at that is no longer feasible to assume that the person who generated that data is the right person to be analyzing that data. And so last year, we wrote a little article about Metcalfe's Law, suggesting that actually the sooner we uncouple those that generate the data from those that analyze it, the better off we will be. And that takes into account the scientists who's squirming in the audience going, but I know the data so much better, and, and I'm the only person who can look at it. And to that, I would say we need to learn how to generate that data and annotate it in ways 
where actually others uh, can use it. Where data is not just uh, a product for uh, a paper, but actually for others to use. The next is uh, something that I think less people in this audience track, which is the remarkable ability in the last five years. This is a um, chronology, but I could have put up uh, Yushahidi. There are lots of examples where public citizens have said, hey, I have this problem. I can track it. I can put that together. I can ask questions. So instead of having an academic researcher sitting in a university being the portal to the knowledge, the ability of citizens to say, hey, I want to follow my disease, or I want to do this, or I want to wear a sensor, or I want to do this, I'll go into this later, is amazingly cheaper to be able to get the data that you need. And so that, and then the last tool is simply, here's Zoran Popovich in uh, Seattle, um, who, with uh, David Baker and others, recognized that passion is what it takes to actually solve a task, not a degree. And so I hope everyone knows the examples, um, whether it's Foldit, whether it's Eterna, where you can ask citizens who have an interest in a problem, can you solve this problem? And the, the ones that get the, I think, appropriate recognition are things that are um, you know, protein biophysics, PhDs who are doing it, and the people who win these uh, challenges often are a housewife in Surrey, puts the kids to bed at night, and then goes off, and as an avatar, beats the people who are working on those problems. So if you put those together, six that I mentioned, omics data, network modeling, the cloud, this uncoupling from data generators from analyzers, the ability to actually have citizens and public share their data, and then who are the experts, are the components that we've been thinking about the last five years. And Sage Bionetworks is a small group, it's about 40 individuals, and what we're interested in doing is running an accelerator, not that spins out companies, but spins out how you could do science. And particularly, how could you do science in new ways that hopefully those pilots, similar to a biotech accelerator, give people something where they can go, oh, I don't really like what you did here, or this was sort of stupid, but I'll do that. So our job, as we see it, is actually to take and try out new tools. And I'm, that, what I'm now going to do is give you four or five examples of things that we've been working on that again, I, I hope what people will do is come up and say, that's sort of interesting, I might be able to do this if I could, and then evolve it from there. That's what we're really interested in. You can get on to that uh, information, look at the website, um, to sagebase.org. So here's the first tool. People have been communicating by writing journal articles since a time when it actually made sense to do that. But now, X hundred years later, you could argue it doesn't really make sense in this digital age to sit there and wait for something to come out in, in paper and a year after you've done the work, get credit for it, and then wait another year for that to come back. So in the last 10 years, um, I'm interested in, in a uh, show of hands here. Um, how many people have worked on or know of GitHub? This is awesome, okay? Because this is just what I want to do. I, I, there were some people who didn't put their hands up, but three years ago, that was uh, maybe 20 people that would put their hands up, or at least four years ago. Um, so what we did, and so I don't have to go through this in, in much detail, was we said, this is unfair. I'm jealous of the software engineers that can sit there, track their code, have other people see it, get credit for it, move it on, et cetera. Why don't we have that capability for the files and the data and the things that we're evolving as ideas? Notice, not as software code, but as ideas. Why can't we do that in biomedical research? We should have a GitHub equivalent. So Mike Kellen, engineering team there, now over the last four years has been building up Synapse. I think many of you have heard of this. It um, shifted from alpha and beta, it's now out, people are, are using it. And what it assumed was medical, biomedical scientists have the same interest that software engineers have to be able to have that type of community. Um, and so the ability to have the history captured, work anywhere, social, et cetera, are there. Um, the heart of Synapse, whether it sits on Transmart, whether it sits on Datasphere, whether it sits on uh, some uh, company uh, um, uh, or biotech uh, uh, IT platform, whether it sits on something that's in the NIH, as I'll show you, its whole concept is we need a workplace where people can talk to each other 
and actually not do it at the time of publication, but get their credit for who, who's doing what instead of not who says they're doing it. So provenance is essential. Provenance basically says, I'm tagging. I did this, this is what I did, and here's who did with it. So whenever you go and look at something similar to the evolution charts you had, it would be very easy to do that with this because this actually gives you a tool that says, here's who did what, what they did with it, why, and it actually um, allows you to um, all the way go up to building uh, papers like that. So that's provenance. I want to give you a couple of quick examples because you might be going, I don't know how I would use that. The first example is the TCGA data in cancer. Um, massive amounts of data were generated on 20 different uh, tumor types. And um, I think you know all the layers of data that were there. After this was all done, people appropriately said, I would like to look across all those tumors, and I'd like to see are there patterns, are there some tumors that are like this or that, are some genes that do this or that. And so uh, Larson Omberg and others basically said, can we use Synapse and put all of the data on TCGA, which was sort of like an Excel sheet, sort of not very easy to get to, um, and curate that, put it on Synapse, make it available, and watched over 100 researchers from 30 institutions start. And what they did was they said, I want to write this paper, I want to write this paper, I want to do this, I want to do that. And we had about 60 or 80 groups that said, I'm going to try to solve this or that. Nine months after they were given the data, there were 12 articles in NPG journals that had been published. Okay? Nine months it took. Okay? And the reason it was so fast, and now it's up to like 20 or something like that. There was one that just came out this last week. It's not just NPG journals. Um, the concept was that people were actually working well enough with each other, putting their data in ways that basically it was so easy to drop it in and get it reviewed and get it accepted. The second is part of the NIH AMP project that some of you know, which brings in industry and brings in academia. And in this instance, there were three slash four large hubs in Alzheimer's that were expected to do experiments where they were working in four different uh, systems from human to, uh, to Drosophila. Um, there were modifications that all these groups were doing in different ways, and they were generating all this data. So what we said was, can we take all the data in each of those universities, so the Broad was on there, um, the Mayo Clinic, et cetera, and let's host all of the data quarterly that all of those universities are generating and allow the technology partners that we're working, so this is industry, places like Takeda and GSK, and allow people to see the data and use that as a way to evolve their experiments. So instead of saying, I have a tech transfer officer that won't allow me to do this or that, right? It makes a lot more sense to be able to get that out and get those ideas uh, moving along. And so Synapse is being used across all of these universities with the um, biotech and, uh, and uh, industry partners. And the concept is you, on a quarterly basis, are sharing everything that you're developing along the way to help each other. And the third example, which is one in the clinical world, which I think uh, is probably the most interesting, stems from a paper that I hope you saw at the beginning of this year that came out from Ali Kalyanami. Um, they have an amazing paper out there that I think trumped the work that was being done at Memorial Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson or any other place I know on personalized medicine. So look at Ali's paper. I'm saying that that paper that showed what happens when you take AML samples, ex vivo you treat it with compounds and shRNAs, you do multiple layers of DNA, RNA, um, protein analysis, and you guide that patient's care according to what you find there, to me, was the most remarkable use of data to guide clinical care. So I was up in Helsinki, I was talking to him, and I knew that Brian Trucker in Oregon Health Science University was doing work that was somewhat similar. <clears throat> I knew work that was going on at the Hutch, down where Dan von Hoff and, and uh, Phoenix children, and we said, Let's take all four of these programs. Usually, these people would be vying for the plenary talks at ASCO and said, why don't you four groups share all of your data in real time on those patients? 
Why don't you share the data you're getting ex vivo? Why don't you share all your omics? And let's run virtual tumor boards that share the data across all of those sites in real time. And when a decision is being made about a hospital, it's not one where it says um, partners or the Dana-Farber found this. It's actually saying, let's use multiple experts in real time to be looking at the data across platforms because only then are we going to have some stable output that might be able to be used uh, in the clinic. The third tool has to do with going to challenges. And um, in this instance, I think most people are uh, f familiar with CASP or TopCoder or other uh, challenges. We were really fortunate here because IBM, Gustavo Stolovitsky, and the Dream Team there had been running challenges mostly about reverse engineering for the last um, five plus years. And we were interested in, you can see my progression. Um, now I'm going outside of experts who know each other and saying, how do you get the equivalent of a million eyeballs on your project? What is the way that you can get the rest of the world to see and try to help you solve something? What's the most efficient way to, to, to get to truth? About a year and a half ago, we ran a, a breast cancer trial where we took clinical and genomic data, 2,200 patients hosted up in the cloud, kept out a validation set, got science translational medicine to um, remarkably agree that the winner of that paper um, was in a slot to have a, a paper. So the interest here is change the incentive reward stru uh, structure. Instead of having a classic peer review, why not have a challenge assisted review? Why not let the person who performed best be the person who gets the paper instead of the standard peer review process? We got Google to host uh, the data, give us uh, um, compute space for the challenges. We had lots of people working on this. I'm not going to go through this challenge. It worked remarkably well. A little over a year ago, the IBM Dream Team merged with Sage, and we started calling these Sage Dream or Dream Sage challenges, because all of them now started being hosted on Synapse as a vehicle by which people could look at the work they were doing. Um, the analysis teams and statistical teams merged so that we could actually carry out those challenges. And last year, we ran, or in the summer last year, we ran three challenges that um, began to have higher numbers of participants. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, these. These were last year's um, work. The number of participants uh, continues to be uh, growing for those, um, for those challenges. Um, and um, much more importantly, if you want to go, let's see, I've heard about challenges. I think of Innocentive. I think of Topcoder. Or maybe I think of Kaggle. Our purpose of doing these challenges had two angles. One of them was, as you can expect, wisdom of the crowd, trying to get the best information out, trying to accelerate the, in the answer. But the other reason we were doing this was we said, can we use this to build a community that actually learns to trust each other and to work with each other and enjoy what happens when teams of people start working together? So the reason we've been running these dream challenges is as much to get an answer, but also to see how could uh, scientists who did not know each other um, be willing to work with each other. And what we learned, which I guess the, um, some people in the audience would have guessed, is that if you want people to share, let them compete. So if you put up a leaderboard, and you see that you're third on the list, and you see that someone on the seventh on the list and you can actually join together, and you'll get to first on the list, that is an incentive to share. And in fact, we put in stage gates like the Tour de France that allow that type of behavior to go on. And in some of the challenges that are going on now, we've gone from having a competitive phase to the challenge to a collaborative phase in order to incent that. More and more of what we're finding now is that people are beginning to enter challenges to change their uh, careers. So the person on the top was a technician here in Boston. Um, he won the whole cell uh, estimation challenge and got into graduate school very rapidly on uh, the awareness of who he was. Wei Yi Cheng was an electrical engineer um, working uh, off of the medical area. He got hired directly into being a faculty member at Mount Sinai. And we have many examples. So people are going on to these challenges for the fun of it. They're going on it 
to solve a problem. They're going on to get the recognition and the credit to move their careers along. I want to talk about one of the uh, challenges now because I want to show you how you can use a challenge to accelerate the adoption of an interoperable standard, which is a different concept of how you have standards. How do you build standards? So um, I think everyone is aware the cost of the genome is dropping. I think um, the um, computational costs are not as well known. And yes, they're um, expensive. I think probably this is going to get covered uh, here this uh, week. But what we were interested in was not cost. What we were interested in was if you look at the accuracy of the calls in cancer, and you look at what is done at Wash U, look at the Broad, look at uh, the Wellcome Trust, you don't want to know about the mismatch and the overlap. Same way foundation medicine versus, OK? There are differences in the way somatic mutations are called in cancers. People have different methods. And everyone says, I have the best method here or the best method there. So we thought was, let's run a somatic mutation calling where we start with synthetic tumor normal pairs, then we go to real uh, tumor normal pairs. This is driven by um, Josh Stewart at um, uh, US, uh, sorry, um, Santa Cruz and um, uh, Paul Boutros up in, in Ontario. And um, you c it, it's open now. You can get to the data. You can look at it. You can see what's going on. What's interesting is that we had certain expectations for how hard it would be to solve these uh, problems. We're in the middle of challenge one, challenge two. Um, we had not expected the number of teams that were um, entering, but the thing that was most unexpected was the solutions that are coming out are an order of magnitude better than were there. It was fun to look the Illumina team come in, not quite at the top of the pack. It was fun to see other researchers come up. There's a team, I think it is in Michigan, I think it's for this challenge, it's blowing everyone out. We do not quite know why. So if they're in the room, congratulations, congratulations, uh, Michigan. Um, Miles Axton and Nature Genetics have been um, a, a kind supporter in terms of uh, teaching us how to work with these. There's an article that came out this last week on this uh, type of process. But why I'm bringing it up is imagine other standards that we use um, and think of how challenges could evolve those. And this is a challenge that doesn't have an end. So we're basically going to run this continually and use it as a way so that people who have um, uh, submitted the best answer are, are, is actually the way that all the analysis in the world is being uh, done. So I think um, this team with Paul and Josh and Adam Marglin are developing a new way to have something that the world uses that's instead of doing it through looking at, at how it's published. I now want to go to something that is, um, again, painfully obvious to some, and that is we're doing a pretty good job of getting genotypic data, and we're not doing such a good job of getting phenotypic data. And we need those. If we're going to solve disease uh, characterizations, we need to have good uh, amounts of data in both realms. Last year, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded us to work on a project called Bridge which is asking, can citizens, can patients play a different role, not just as uh, people who are um, uh, um, having disease, giving small information, but can they actually be partners in, in the research uh, process? So we've been interested in what does it take to bring in people who have diseases and treat them other than just as subjects? and basically assume that those partners, whether they be patients, researchers, or funders, should have more equal roles. A lot of health tracking has been tried, is going on, in terms of you know, sources of billable procedures. You know the, the big players. For uh, patients as individuals on platforms, you know some of the examples that have gone on there. For patient communities as market segments, there are various leaders there. Patient data is a product. Don't ever forget that groups like patients like me and 23andMe are in that business to give you entertainment in order to take your data and to find out a way of monetizing that. Don't ever think that it's a, it's a single loop. There's another loop in there, and it's data as product. What we were interested in is seeing, could we have patients as research uh, partners as an alternative to that? And, and what, would be, what would happen if you did that? 
So what we assumed was the loop that most people think about is citizen doctor. I think that's an important loop. Our attitude actually is if you don't bring the data scientists and don't aggregate that data and have someone else other than a physician look at it, it's moderately interesting. And it would be much more interesting if there are ways where citizens could look at their data, have insights, see what things were occurring, and also be able to upload that, aggregate it, and, and put another loop in. So we're running uh, projects now in three areas, in Parkinson's disease, on breast cancer survivors, and in sleep quality and medications, who actually gets any benefit out of the drugs that are approved in, in sleep. And we're doing this on a web mobile app uh, design based process. So for one of these, this is Max Little. Um, this is um, Ray Dorsey. In, in Parkinson's disease, the, if you only look twice or once a year, there's a chronic decline in Parkinson's patients. But actually, there's a real undersampling problem. And if actually you look in real time at what's going on in their disease, if you had a way to have objective feeds right off of the patients, what you'll see, like in many diseases, is the day-to-day -day variation is an order of magnitude more than the change that's going on. So whether it's for enrollment into clinical trials or whether it's to try to find ways to help patients, that's the real signal that we're interested in. And so we've been working on ways to take objective, subjective data, passive feeds, um, uh, structured tests, surveys, and have that data flow up into the cloud so that most of the health apps that are being designed today have this inner loop. They have an idea, I will look at my data, I'll be interested in myself, I may compare it to others. That's nice. But it's really a travesty when I'm talking about sustainability because do you know how hard it is to get your data off of this or do you know how hard it is to get data from Medtronic? Okay. Do you know how valuable it would be if we started being able to share that data and aggregate that table, data? So we're interested in turning anecdotes into signals and putting that into the hands of citizens and patients so they can work with it. And the outer loop is one that says, as you take that data and aggregate it, put it up in the cloud, you'll make sense out of that and you'll have a different loop than you do for what I'd say is um, health apps as entertainment. So it's thinking beyond health apps as, uh, as entertainment. And if you're a company who's trying to sell devices, that's probably should be your major interest. But actually, the patients actually don't have only that interest. They have an interest in what's actually done with that data. So these are the types of designs that we've been uh, working on. So you could have mobile and um, web-based apps. The data could go up as study designs, come back to the patients. They could see what was going on. They could watch who was doing what. So this is the type of thing. It allows us to have questions running along, events, blood counts, um, looking not just at the symptoms, but what modulates. So think of an XY axis. One is all the data feeds we're using to look at objective data on the symptoms, and the Y axis being those that are actually looking at modulators. So if you followed the talk and to the next to the last uh, uh, part of it, you'll see I, I was talking about that loop up there of bringing the patient data. Notice then you can put that onto Synapse. Notice you can then run challenges. So the power of combining some of these open tools is that you begin to have crowdsourced data analysis that's far better than just a sort of unlimited citizen science like cat pages on the web. Okay? There's a real advantage of being able to tie those loops uh, together. And so right before I close, I just want to give a little um, trailer um, about a month ago. I gave a talk in uh, TED. It's going to be released next month because I feel strongly that we're looking and putting too many resources into examining patients that may not be telling us the most information. So almost all of us, um, certainly including myself, have put careers into identifying the broken parts in diseases. So we've looked at sick people, and when we look at sick people, we have found those things that are defective. Those who do drug discovery here know virtually never do those lead to new therapies, okay? You can go down the list. Cystic fibrosis actually is an example that's turned, okay? But it was turned in an interesting way, um, but um, Tay-Sachs, ataxia, et cetera. And so we were interested in why is this dilemma between the power to diagnose yet the lack to fully treat? 
And so in the spirit of Helen Hobbs PCSK9, in the spirit of CCR5 and what was done in AIDS, in the spirit of Stu Orkin and what he did on the hemoglobinopathies, we've been working on a project that takes every single childhood disease, and among all those childhood diseases, finds the mutations that are highly penetrant, and then assumes that who you should look at is not those that are sick, that what you want to do is you want to go to adults over 40 who have no evidence of disease and find the unexpected heroes that sit among us that actually are the keys to developing the therapies. We believe if you want to accelerate drug discovery, the thing to do is to look for second site suppressors and to do it in a systematic way across all the diseases. So we're starting with childhood diseases. We're going out to look at a, a million individuals. I'll be more ready to talk about this uh, in about a month. So today, I've talked about tools and approaches being piloted by partners to enable sustainable research. I want you, when you leave here, when you go to other talks, to go, are we doing this in an affordable way? Can we possibly afford to do it if you're siloing data here or you're not thinking who else can use that data? We're interested in expanding the pool of experts beyond those that are existing to the emerging experts because there are lots of reasons why more people need to be looking at it. So I'm going to pose three questions. The first is, how ready are you, as a person, sitting here, ready to navigate this discontinuity between the way our research and biotech institutions currently are structured and the state of the nascent technology? I'm much more worried about the academics than, I'm, than I am about those in industry and biotech. They've learned a lot of the rules to work in teams that academics are unable to, to use because of the way we structure their tenure systems and reward systems. Um, there are skills that are needed to live in this world that I don't think we train people into having about collaboration, about how the, what you really want to do is to let others work with you and to work on your problems. And so the last, um, think, thinking of an open knowledge currency exchange, I have two uh, questions that I want to end uh, with, which is, what will it take to have it be in the self-interest of researchers for them to ask, how can I get the most people looking at my ideas and data as quickly as possible? So what's it going to take to have that be the way we think? And also, what will it take for funders, whether it's the Wellcome Trust or the Gates or NIH, to demand that the valuable data that they have funded to be generated actually be pushed out into as many other people's hands for reanalysis and pressure testing as soon as possible? Thanks very much. Thank you.